Good morning, community. How are you? The three of you are doing really well up here. I'm excited to hear from you. That's awesome. So the rest of community, how are you? All right. Um, if you'll stand, uh, we're going to get started. Um, Father God, we just invite you into this place. Uh, we pray against distraction for this next little bit. And we, God, we just hope that you feel honored and praised by our offering. Um, set aside all distraction, God. Um, we live in joy knowing that we can lay it down for you right now, that you'll take it, that you want it, and you want relationship with us. So, God, we dedicate this time to you. Uh, we hope you feel honored and praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. 
uncomfortable silence. <laughs> I think sometimes God, in, like, especially when, I think he's okay with silence. Gives us time to hear him. He's not okay with kicking the power source. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. Thank you all for coming this morning, and I do pray that that is what happens, that the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts and prepares us as we sing today. Uh, a few announcements. Our budget uh, review is now. It's starting now. The voting is located out there on a table. You can get a copy of the budget. You can, if you want more information about the budget, you can come talk to Chris. He would love to tell you a little bit more. Um, I always like throwing Chris under the bus. It's fun. Um, or you can come and talk to Dan or myself. We would love to tell you what we can about the budget. Um, and then you can vote. And uh, yeah, so we also have a Christmas lunch coming up on December 18th, directly following the service. We're going to ask you all to provide the pasta dishes. There are pans like this located out there. They help us kind of know that we have enough food coming. We will provide the breadsticks, the salad, dessert, and things like that. But we'd love it if you guys would take a pan. And you don't necessarily have to use the pan, but bring a pasta dish. Uh, for that Christmas lunch on the 18th. Um, we have our Christmas giving that's happening right now. There's a few different, uh, three in particular, ways that you can give for Christmas. You can find the details on those online, or you can go to our Church Center app and designate some giving towards them. This is something we like to do each year just because some of you really enjoy giving around the Christmas season, and so we would love if you wanted to bless either the church or Bethesda Ministries, or the Oliver Apartments, uh, you can give in that way. Let me pray, and we will get back. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot. I told him I wasn't going to forget, and I forgot anyway. 
Dan, you get to talk now. Okay, did you tell them about those dishes? I, I wasn't paying attention. The pans? Yeah. Yeah, thanks okay. for listening to my announcements. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> good. Hey, speaking of uh, strange things, though, um, when Adam started singing that Uncomfortable Silence, that sounded really good, didn't it? Yeah. I think you ought to write a song. Uncomfortable the Silence? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't go with that one. I, that might have been taken. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, he started singing that, and I thought, this could be good. What are we singing? Um, I was ready to join in, but they didn't put the words up there. So it, in there, uh, two other things I did want to mention. I wanted to add a little bit about the budget. Uh, our Constitution says that uh, only members are to vote on the budget every year, so that will be available for a few weeks online and out there if you'd like to vote. But anybody can pick that up and look and ask any questions. When we first started doing this, we would say, hey, we're having a meeting after church for anybody who has any questions. Nobody ever came. And seriously, for several years in a row, which I guess that's nice. <laughs> but, but if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, the other guy, Josh, mentioned Chris because Chris has worked a lot with it and he would have a lot of answers. But one of the things I wanted to say about that is we did change this year. We have always posted everybody's salary. You know, Dan makes, Josh makes, uh, like that. And we lump those together this year, but that doesn't mean those are secret. If you still want to know what I make, uh, just don't tell my wife. If it, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I was thinking the reason why we stopped doing that is so people would not hit me up for loans all the time, you know, <laughs> like that. But, uh, no, actually, it's a little bit of the idea because that information is out there to everybody. Uh, I told you this story, and I'm taking too long with it, but... One year we had those out there. My son-in-law and my son were out in the lobby. Hey, I didn't know he made this. Uh, we better pay for dinner and lunch today. But um, they, we're, we're, it's a little bit from the privacy standpoint, but yet at the same time, we want to stay transparent about that. So if you're like, I really would like to know what pastors make, you're welcome to know. Whether you ask me or Chris, we can get that information for you. Okay, sorry, you guys look like... Couple of flies getting ready, uh, like that. Sorry, they just got some hand sanitizer, which reminds me, I did want to point Jody out for a minute here. This is a very last minute thing. Lorraine Shotwell uh, sent this to me this week. Uh, she has connected up us a couple times with the Spa Ministries down in Elkhart, which is a uh, you know a residence for ladies there. And um, we got a note from them this week uh, asking the, if there were some folks that we have, ladies only, because of the situation but who would like to send some Christmas cards to the residents there. Now, it is ladies only, and it is also cards only. They only want cards and notes of encouragement, not money or cards put in there. Uh, and the instructions are on a little piece of paper here and a list of 15 names. So if you're like, I'd like to send a note to all 15 of them to encourage them, great. Or if you'd like to just take one or two, uh, Jody has those, and uh, you can catch that from her afterwards. I'm sorry about that, but that's last minute. But I wanted to get those out if I, if I could. All right. Uh, Father, uh, we're so thankful. We're so thankful. Uh, just even as we sing, um, I was thinking of the first words of the song we started with this morning about uh, with heavy hearts, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the burden has gotten heavy. And Lord, I know some folks come in with heavy hearts and they seek just to find a peace in you today. Uh, Lord, uh, I'm thankful too just that we have the opportunity to lift up your great name. I'm thankful we have the opportunity to, to sing about the, the coming king, Jesus, and uh, that we can just gather here and praise you. So, Lord, uh, we, we do ask that you continue to um, inhabit, I guess I would say, the praises of your people as we worship now in your name. Amen. Would you join us again in standing, please? <coughs>
Our Father, we do rejoice at the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. May we, through our time of worship and through our time of looking at your word, may we know you better. And we, may we know that peace better. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we move into the adoration of our Prince of Peace here today, I get to begin by talking about the United States coming in first place. <laughs> in what is the question? Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to offend all the soccer fans here for a minute. I don't know who you are except for Pastor Josh. Uh, but we did not come in first place in soccer. I've been harassing him all week about this sport in which we scored two goals in three games and somehow advanced. I didn't completely understand how that happened. I was coming up with a list of ways to improve soccer for Pastor Josh. I thought if you took that round ball, kind of squished it down, made it more oblong, and instead of those uh, cages at the end, you just called them end zones. Yeah, now you got something we could watch. I, th I thought that was pretty good. Uh, the United States is not victorious. We're not number one when it comes to soccer. Uh, however, however, there is something we're number one in. I read this week that the WHO, which I used to think was just a rock band from the 70s and 80s, but now, now I know that it is the World Health Organization. Uh, and I know that they came out with a little study that said that by far, actually like two to one over the second place country, America leads the world in anxiety, fear, and depression. Okay, isn't that, isn't that sad and, and, and that kind of weird? But that, that is what they tell us. In fact, uh, they said that the number one reason why people go to the doctor in the United States is because of stress, because of anxiety, because of fear. The number one reason why things are prescribed in the United States is because of stress, because of anxiety, because of fear. Uh, this grips us so much, that, and we see the incredible importance then of peace. And today, as we focus on the Prince of Peace, we want to focus on that inner peace. Okay, we want to focus on that which is not anxiety and everything like that. Whenever I start, um, usually if I'm preaching from a text, which I'm normally doing, uh, I like to start, and, and this is just something, you know, you're, you're taught in school, you start by reading the text over and over again. So you're not taking, you know, you're not starting with a book you read or something over here, you're starting with the text. So I always try to do that, and then when you get onto a topical message, which is what we've been doing now, the thing to do is to gather all the verses about that topic. So a few weeks ago when I started looking into talking about peace, I decided to look up, and uh, I've always made a list, you know, of all the verses on one side, and then you go through and you write down what it says about the topic. Well, guess how many verses there are in the Bible about peace? There are 300, I'm sorry, 407 verses about, that talk about peace, and another 250 that use the word shalom, okay? So you're getting shortchanged. I did not do a complete study. <laughs> Okay. I did not look up every one of those verses, but I started gathering a whole lot about the idea of this peace that comes in our life. You have probably heard before, too, the, the, uh, you, you may have heard this, I, I hear it a lot around Christmas time, that there are 365 times in Scripture where it says, fear not. Have you ever heard that one for each day of the year or, or whatever like that? But we're going to you know, dig into that and dive into that because it definitely is a huge problem, and uh, the Bible's not silent about it. Um, we are not made to handle stress. And, you know, I think I can speak to this, even though you might say, well, you're not a doctor. I am not, but I think it is a pretty well-known fact that stress is terrible for us in so many different ways. It even destroys our immunity, stuff like that. So when we're living with anxiety and fear and things like that, 
uh, you know, we are doing something that we weren't designed to do, bearing that weight, bearing that anxiety, that stress and everything like that. We were not designed to do that. So we're going to dive uh, into some scripture here and start with some uh, teaching of Jesus from John chapter 14. Uh, Jesus is already in John chapter 14 talking to the disciples about his departure. Okay, he begins in John chapter 14 with something that many of you could quote with me if I start to say it. Let not your hearts be troubled. And he's going to say it again. And he's talking about his departure. But he says, these things have I spoken to you while I'm still with you. Now, he's saying right now I'm still with you. But he has also been letting them know he's not going to be with them. I want you to remember that because to talk about something that would create some stress for these disciples. They have left all to follow him. And now, wait a minute, you're leaving? <laughs> this is not good, okay? That's the situation they're in. But the helper, when I leave, the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Then Jesus goes on and he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, okay? I'm going to leave peace. It is my peace, not the world, not the one the world gives to you. That, that's not the one I'm going to leave with you. Then he says again, let not your hearts be troubled. Neither be, let them be afraid. You have heard uh, me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. There's a couple of battles, I guess we could say, that go on in life, go on in our life, go on in our minds that are highlighted in here. One of them is the battle between faith and fear. And uh, we're going to talk briefly about that idea. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. We often, though, however, are driven, you know, more by fear than by faith. And then also there's a contrast that we'll look at between what Jesus talked about, not the peace the world gives, not the world's peace, but my peace. And we'll really focus most of our time on that peace that Jesus gives. So let's start, though, however, to, with this fear and faith uh, battle that goes on. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus says, And there will be signs of the sun and the stars and the moon. I don't know what order I put those in. And on the earth there will be distress of nations in per perplexity. Okay, there is going to be distress of nation and perplexity. They don't know what's happening because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, because of everything going on, all the turmoil, there is going to be stress, there is going to be perplexity, there is going to be fear. Uh, people are not going to know what to do. People will be fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the earth will be shaken. Now, let's, uh, let's just talk for just a couple minutes. And again, I don't want to highlight and spend too much time on this. But hopefully you can agree with me somewhat that fear is a big deal, okay? Uh, that it is used constantly to motivate people and to move people. Okay, now I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender here today. Okay, I'm going to list a bunch of different things that the news tries to scare us about. I'm going to tell you ahead of time, some of them you're going to say, well, we should be scared about that. And that's where we're going to disagree. So we're not going there. Okay, but if you think about when you watch the news, what is, by the way, political campaigns too. Very seldomly do you have a, a, a candidate say, hey, I am, here's what I'm going to do and here's how I'm going to help people. Basically it's, hey, if you vote for that other guy, the world's coming to an end. You know that, right? You're going to lose your freedom. You're going to lose your health care. You're going to lose all your money. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's just going to come to an end. It is all motivated by fear. And, you know, the things that we're afraid of, we might, again, here's my uh, equal opportunity offense. We might be scared about global climate change, uh, might be scared about disease, might be scared about economic turmoil. We might be scared, you know, just in general about war, about nuclear attack and, and what's going on there. But these things are always thrown in our faces. Uh, you know, how can we motivate these people with fear? Well, I would like you to take a moment, and we'll work on this uh, through the course of the sermon, but I'd like you to take a moment and kind of identify what would you say is your biggest fear, if you have one. Again, we're not going to glorify this. We're going we're gonna to get rid of it, but I want you to think about it for a moment here. Uh, you know, maybe you know, I wrote down some different things that I know of. Maybe there's something uh, your biggest fear involves your kids. For a lot of people, that's it. You know, where are they going? What are they doing with their life? Uh, and sometimes seemingly heading in the wrong direction. Our health is obviously a huge fear for many people. Um, so many, you know, scary things out there, and especially those of us that are uh, getting older. Our job, 
you know, security of our job. You know, is this, is this going to work out? Is this going to stay? Are there going to be shutdowns coming? What's going on? How am I going to care for my parents? What should I do? You know, they're getting older. They need help. I don't know where to put them. I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't know, you know, where to take them. What's the best thing for them? Some of us, again, we're scared about terrorism or we're scared about war. Um, some of us, it's the price of eggs, okay? <laughs> you know, I say that somewhat kiddingly. Um, I, you know, I'd heard about inflation, you know, in recent days, every, every talk about that, but I do not do any of the grocery shopping in our family. It's just a system that works. Uh, apparently, I don't ever get the right thing. If you send me into the store and ask me to get a can of green beans, I get the wrong can of green beans. Uh, if I'm supposed to get milk and, and I, I get the blue lids instead of the pink lids, I just never get it right somehow. And uh, if it's butter, I never know whether to get salted or unsalted. I still don't know what that means. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I always pick the wrong one somehow. So I don't do grocery shopping. So you know, I heard about inflation. I was no big deal. Last week, we were gathering together with our family, and Francis and I went to a grocery store out in Nebraska, and we fill up the cart. I'm sorry, not fill up the cart. You see these carts overloaded. And I thought, man, that probably costs 100 bucks. Uh, but, uh, but we put just the lower level. I mean, we barely covered the bottom of the cart. And I'm standing in the checkout. I said, how much is this going to be? Like 60 bucks? Princess just started laughing. <laughs> She's like, you really don't get out much, do you? And sure enough, it was, it was double that. Uh, and it was, it was just for a little bit. I, was, I couldn't believe it. But there's, there's always something about which we can be afraid. Um, I saw they uh, have a movie out this year called uh, I Heard the Bells uh, based on that song. And I was thinking about that. There's a line in there that talks about peace. You know, there is no peace on earth because hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth. And I thought maybe it should be fear is strong and mocks that because as far as internally, it is fear that is often robbing us. So, so Jesus described this situation here that is c coming and people are going to be perplexed. They're going to be uh, fainting with fear. But... In the next couple of verses, he go goes on and he says, Then will they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, what does Jesus say to do? Straighten up. Raise up your heads because redemption is drawing near. Some of you remember the old song, lift up your head. Your redemption draws mine. But you can either look to the circumstances or you can look to God. You can expect God to do a work. You can expect the, uh, Satan to have a good time and continue to do the work. But we're going to make a choice whether we're going to walk in faith or whether we're going to walk in fear. Now, before we leave this and go to the other battle between the world's peace, talk about the world's peace and Jesus' peace, um, I just wanted to give you something that has been a big help to me. Uh, along this topic, I remember uh, a pastor of mine back 40 years ago, he would always say this phrase. He said, he said, my life has been filled with so many catastrophes, some of which actually happened. Okay? So I want you just to remember when we think about this, one of three things is going to happen with those things that we're afraid about. And I, this, this applies to me so strongly because I, I've mentioned this before. When bad things actually happen, and my wife will back me up on this, I'm pretty good. You know, we're really going through a hard time. I'm in pretty good shape. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm walking with Him. Where I lose it a lot of times is things that I think might happen. Anybody else struggle with that? I get more afraid about things that maybe could happen than not. So if I, this really helps me to remember one of three things. Either the thing that you're afraid of happening never happens, which studies say that's about 80% of the time. Or they happen, but they're not really as bad as you thought they were going to be. Or and somewhere in the category of 10% or less of the time, they happen, but God will see me through. And I can look back at my life and say that. So this has been a tool I just thought I'd sneak in there that might help you to remember if there's something in the future that, uh, of which has me scared. It hasn't happened yet. There's nothing I can do about it at this point. Uh, but it is keeping me up at night. I want to give to God. So let's, let's th then go to this idea here of these two pieces. Like I said, I want to spend uh, most of our time today talking about the peace of God. So... Um, as we think about the word, Jesus said, I'm going to give you my peace, not the peace of the world. Well, what is the world's peace? The world's peace is going to be fragile. It's going to be uh, in impacted by circumstances, and it is also going to be temporary. Now, you want a quick, great quote from the sermon. Here we go. Temporary things don't last. <laughs> and that was profound. I thought I spent a lot of time studying and digging into, you know, how I could say that well. But there are so many things that people try to 
in which people try to find peace. That's very simply the problem is they don't last. Now, some of those things are harmful. And as they try to find peace in them, they're tearing apart their families and everything like that. And we get addicted to certain things because the peace that they gave lasts only temporarily. You know, things and th those things come to mind easily, whether it's alcoholism or, you know, drugs or uh, pornography, uh, things that you find a temporary, uh, this is going to take the edge off, you know, this is going to help me uh, temporarily, and we get, and then there becomes an addiction. There are a lot of other things that we'll say could be harmful if really taken to extreme, but not really in and of themselves bad. But still, we're trying to find peace in them. We're, find, we're, we're, we're happy and we're satisfied with a temporary peace. And I'm not talking against any of these things because some of these things, you know, hey, this is good. I'm glad you can do this. But, you know, just sitting down with a good cup of coffee sometimes, boy, that's when I find peace. I'm not talking against that. I'm just saying if that's the only place we're finding peace, then all we're ever finding probably is a world's peace in a lot of cases because it's just a temporary thing. It's not going to sustain us. I read a story this week about a lady that found her peace in exercise, but she became so addicted to it that she actually ruined her life through exercise. I had to steal that story because obviously that's not my situation. Uh, but, um, but, you know, it was just like I, I have to. You know, it's like that adrenaline. I had to ha have this, again, because it's temporary. So what Jesus is saying, yeah, th there is peace to be found in the world. But I have a peace that goes beyond that. I have a peace that is not fragile. It is not circumstantial. I have a peace that is abiding, that is trans-circumstantial. And again... He was talking to these disciples that were facing what had to have been a, a terrible time in their life that would produce terror. Wait, wait, we left everything to follow this guy. He's leaving. And this is the, G and remember that Jesus is the one that um, could stand before Pontius Pilate and face the cross and still have perfect peace. And he said, that's the peace that I want you to have. Okay, I want you to have that peace. And as we abide in him, and as he abides in us, well, he is the one who owns the peace. He's the one who manufactures the peace. He is the one who distributes the peace. Uh, so, and I want you to think about this for a moment. Picture a f worried Jesus. You don't, do you? And now, you know, different Movies and stuff like that have tried to portray, portray Jesus. Uh, some of you uh, um, probably watched The Chosen. Some, and you see the Jesus they have in there, or the, uh, what was the, Mel Gibson, um, The Passion. Uh, but you watch, or just the story of Jesus, and you see how they depict Jesus. Well, I realize that those are Hollywood or whatever depictions of Jesus, but they never have him frazzled. Do you know why? Because if you search the Scriptures, you can't find that. You can't find Jesus like, I don't know what to do about this. You know, in every situation that Jesus faces, and think again about his life. Well, that's because he had it good. Well, we obviously know that's not true. His life here on earth uh, was as tough as it could get in, in, and ended uh, horribly, and yet Jesus continued to have peace. So this is the peace that he wants us to have. This is the birthright that when we are born again that we get from him. And our proximity to Jesus is going to be in exact proportion to our peace, or our peace is going to be in exact proportion to our proximity to Jesus and our closeness to Him. He wants us to have this peace. So, as we explore His peace, uh, the first thing I thought we'd just real quickly talk about why we want to have this peace in our life, one of the things that is going to provide is guidance. The Scripture says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, let me just tear that apart for just a second or dig into that a little bit more. That word rule, that let the peace rule in your heart, it has to, it's the same root that we think of for like an umpire. In other words, he is going to guide us as far as decisions go and making judgments on things. Let that peace of God rule in our hearts. And if we do not walk in the peace of God, we are going to be subject to very, very poor decisions often. Can, can we connect with that? Now, I want to be careful about this. You say, Pastor, do you think that the peace is a good way to determine God's will? We have all, at one point or another, and I am sure I will say again, I have said, hey, I really have a peace about this. I feel like God has given me a peace about this choice. 
And I think we have to be honest and say that there are many situations in our life where the Bible does not really speak to it. In fact, we might even have a hard time finding Bible principles, and we seek God, and we operate on peace. However, we do need to be careful about that because, and this is coming from an old guy, okay? Old pastor, been around, but I know uh, other pastors would say the same thing. I have heard multitude of people who said, I really have peace about what I'm doing, and what they're doing is totally contrary to the Word of God and its principles. That's not a peace that comes from God. So you have to be careful. You might be able to talk yourself into, oh, yeah, I have peace about that. If it goes against the Word of God, if it goes against His principles and His truth, not good. Okay, then that is not the peace. However, at the same time, uh, the idea of operating in peace helps out our navigational system, if you will. Our navigational system is going to be fouled up if we are operating in anxiety. A second thing that uh, reason why we want to make sure we have God's peace is for protection. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, what will it do? It will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus is going to be the protection. Now, I mentioned before, if we do not have peace, if we're living in anxiety, it is dreadful for our health. And I, I don't think I'm talking, you know, about just making things up. I think this is established that our immune system is compromised by stress a great deal. Okay? We are more vulnerable to outside things and bad outside things. Okay, you can definitely carry that over into the spiritual life. Okay? When I am operating, when I am... If you want to say it like this, you know, the distracted driving, you know, is dangerous. You know, you ever walk down the road or ride down the road and you see somebody and they're, they're all over the place and you get up there and, you know, they're either on their phone or they're putting on their makeup or they're eating lunch and trying to find that one French fry that fell on the ground, you know, because they're distracted. I think Frances has learned she doesn't even point things out to me anymore. We, we got this new car, you know, has these beepers that go off when you change lanes. It's really irritating. I figure out how to turn that off. Uh, but uh, the, uh, but uh, I think she's learned not to point things out because next thing you know, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> like that. What building do you think is going in there? She asked me later. You remember back there? <laughs> what building do you think that is? Because if she asked me at the time, I'm staring at it. Next thing you know, you hear the beep, 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 uh, like that. But that distracted driving is dangerous. Distracted living, when I'm distracted by stress all the time, is dangerous. God puts it in our life that he will guard us with that. A third thing why we want to have it in our life is it becomes the platform for our testimony. When the Bible is talking about the armor of God, about uh, uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said that you, the shoes of your feet, having put on a readiness given by the gospel of peace. Okay, the foundation of our witness, the foundation of our Christian life here comes uh, from this uh, idea that I have the gospel of peace within my life, that I have a peace and testimony. I've shared this story before. I want to share it kind of quickly just because I think it's per- very powerful to the point. My father was the exact opposite personality-wise than I am. In fact, uh, some of you are thinking, I'd like to meet him. Uh, but but he was, uh, inc- for one thing, he was incredibly scared to death of getting up in front of people. I mean, that, that just petrified him. I can remember being beside him in church, and the pastor would call on him to pray. And seriously, we slid away for fear of... <laughs> floods. Uh, I mean, he, w- he would just get scared to death. I mean, he hated to talk to people. He was, he was very intimidated by that to the place where, I mean, it was, it, it, well, when my dad came to Christ, he wanted to, and this is a natural thing, he wanted to share his faith. And, uh, and therefore, he tr- made a test. My dad was, you ever go into a you know, restroom somewhere and you find a track that's left behind? My dad did that all the time. I don't have to talk to anybody. I'm going to try. Dad always had tracks with him. Every time we'd go to a restaurant, you know, he'd leave a track with a tip and stuff like that because he wanted to share his faith. He was passionate about that. But talking to people scared the woogies out of him. And he would go try to go out on church visitation. And again, just see, he would just say, hey, hey, hey. uh, it, it would petrify him. However, um, this is back late 70s, early 80s. I don't remember, but recession hit. My dad lost his job. And... Um, he had a friend that he had been inviting to church for years, a guy named Jim, I still remember. And I remember Jim called him up one night and said, hey, Jack, he said, I got to have what you have. He said, we're losing our jobs, and you have some peace that I don't have. I got to have it. And Jim showed up at church, and Jim trusted Jesus Christ. Now, for years, for years, my dad had just said, oh, I need to witness. I need to share my faith with other people, and was scared to death to do it. But the one thing that gave him a platform to share his faith was the peace that he had in the midst of the storm. So we want to go through life 
because then we have guidance. Our, our system isn't messed up. Then we have safety in Him. Then we have a platform for our faith. We want to have that. Well, how are we going to do that? The first thing I want to suggest very strongly is through submission to Him. We, uh, last week when we started the Prince of Peace idea, we talked about the word peace, the word shalom. We did not talk about the word prince. You know that is a term of royalty, right? He is the king of kings, okay? Uh, we love to sing, and well, we should, about the, he is my father. I know him as a father. I know him as a friend. But we also know him as a king. He also, we also know him as a ruler. And our submission to him is a key to us being at peace. Very simply, well, I'm really struggling with things. One of the questions that I would have to ask you if I care about you is, is there an area of your life where you're just saying no to God? You're not going to have peace. He's king. Okay? You're not going to have it. So the first thing to look at is, is, and realize is this need for submission. A second thing is the Spirit. And I've got all the words capitalized, so you can't tell, but I'm talking there about the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 8, 5, and 6. For those who set the, uh, I'm sorry, who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set their mind on the flesh is death, but to set on the minds on the Spirit is life and peace. So not only do we want to have a submissive life, we want to have a Spirit-filled life. We want to figure out exactly what that means. Largely, it means still, again, obedience. Where God speaks to me, I respond. God says, hey, um, you know, that attitude that you have right now towards your wife is terrible. <laughs> the Holy Spirit convicts me and shows me that. So I respond. I, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but I think sometimes we, we need to take a moment and say that because I just know my, my own life. Sometimes it just comes down to real simply, I know what I ought to do. It's very plain, God's Spirit, but I'm not going to listen to the Spirit. I'm going to grieve Him instead. I'm going to do what I want to do. And so often it comes down to that. But if I'm not submitting to him, if I'm not following his leadership and his guidance, and again, his guidance is never going to go against his word. So I want to be in his word. I want to know his truth and his, and his principles. Uh, but as he leads, and, you know, and sometimes it's the type of thing, I'll walk away. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you. And, and uh, what I really feel like, you know, sometimes God will say, hey, why don't you stop and pray with her? Uh, I was on the phone with somebody yesterday, and I thought I should, I should pray, I should pray. I, should. I think it was God's Spirit saying, pray for them. Guess what I did? And I said goodbye. You know, and sometimes through life, you know, I just do that. I know what, you know, but I want to be sensitive. I want to be looking for the Spirit's leading in my life uh, because that's going to be a key to peace is my obedience. A third thing that will be a key to us having peace is praise. The psalmist wrote, and he said, yet you are holy and you are enthroned on the praises of Israel. I want you to think again about that idea of his rulership. He is the prince of peace, uh, but he's enthroned on our praises. The scripture also talks about is inhabiting our praises. So a big part, again, of having peace, I think, is having praise part of our life because he's enthroned on that. He takes that seat, the prince of peace in our life in praise. So I have said this a number of times, but I want to reiterate the importance of you worshiping God not just as we gather together. By the way, I, I really do just love worshiping with you all. I, I do. I just, I get excited. I was even ready to just sing awkward silence and praise God. Uh, and that I, I was ready to go. And I, I'll tell you something else that I hate. I haven't figured out a great remedy for this. I hate taking a break from worship and doing announcements. I do. I, I, I hate announcements. Now, we tried them at the beginning. Nobody listened. We tried them at the end. Nobody listened. So now we do them in the middle. No one listens. But, uh, <laughs> but, we're, but we're still trying to uh, put, put them in there. But, the, but I, I love that we, that we do that. Okay, and I, and I want you to know as long as I have a say in anything going on here, we're going we're gonna to stop and we're, we're going to, more than that, I want you to be able to come here and just worship, just lift him up, just, just talk about who he is. I want you to be able to do that. I want you also to learn to do that in your own lives uh, on a daily basis, whether that means sing to him, whether that means make a list of thankfulness to him, whatever that means. I know I've been saying this, but I want to reemphasize this. This is so important that he be praised for he's enthroned on these praises, okay? So, all right, so having peace, we got three things so far. Let's add a fourth. And this word, I don't know I love this word, but uh, this is really what I wanted to bring some things around here today. I want you to think about this verse that many of you may know, and it is you're casting all your anxieties on him 
because he cares for you. Okay. I want us to take some time today to do that. Uh, and that's why I said earlier, would you take a moment and identify the thing that maybe has, is producing some fear in your life, maybe something that is keeping you up at night, okay? This statement, I think, is, is powerful. I think I heard Craig Rochelle say it. I'm not sure. Uh, somebody this weekend listening, I heard him say it. But he said, the thing about which you worry the most is the thing about which you trust God the least. Okay, now that's, that's a convicting statement. It's also very true. The thing about which I worry the most is the thing about which I trust God the least. And I wanted you to take a few minutes with me and think about the birds. Okay? Here we go. Uh, talk about the little birdies here for a few minutes. You might remember that in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus was talking to people, he said, consider, think about the birds. Okay? Remember them. Because uh, they don't worry. The Father takes care of them, and they don't worry. When he was talking about anxiety, he said, think about the birds. So I want you to think about the birds with me for a few minutes, if you, if you can. Uh, and interesting, one, one thought that I have, first of all, you know, uh, when I'm taking a walk at night, occasionally there will be something that flies. You know, it's dark, and it flies and swoops, and Francis will say, there goes a bird. And I'm like, nah, it's not a bird. Uh, birds aren't flying right now. That's a little ugly little thing. It looks like a rodent with wings. Uh, and uh, that, that's not a bird, because birds aren't up at night. And, you know, you don't go out at night to listen to the birds sing, okay? It has to be real early in the morning. The sun starts to come up. You know why? Because you know what they're doing? They're sleeping. But I thought this was interesting uh, in one of the studies that I was looking at about it, they were, they were saying, you know, this isn't, when we're talking about casting our cares upon God, it's not saying, ah, I don't have any responsibility, I don't care about it, I'm just trusting God, I'm not doing anything. They said, think about the birds here for, for a second, what do they do when they're hungry? They find food, okay, but then they sleep at night. So in other words, if there's something they can do, it's a difference between a caring about something and having anxiety, or, or I'm sorry, concern over something and having anxiety over something. I have to be concerned about the things I can do what I can do, but at the same time, if I'm living with this anxiety, that's where the pain comes in. And the bird cares enough to go get itself some food, but the bird does not uh, stay up all night worrying about it, if you want to say it like that. And somehow we need to find the balance there. Uh, what's what's the uh, what's the phrase? Uh, we should be doing and not stewing sometimes about th things like that. In other words, there's there's things. So, but this is such a struggle. Okay, this is a struggle that I wrestle with. By the way, <laughs> if I can be real honest with you, I've been thinking a ton about this this week, and I I have found myself worrying about worrying. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Stink, I'm worrying about this now. Uh, that can't be good for me. I mean, this is a struggle that we have. And when you talk about casting your care upon God, I just wanted us to be very honest for a moment here because many times we cast it and then we take it back. Uh, uh, you know, what I mean is, you know, we, we give it to God in the morning and by 10 o'clock it's right back. And, you know, God, I don't want to worry about this. I want to get, and sometimes it's like, you know, maybe you sing a little song and you've prayed and, and it's good. I'm not going to worry about that. But something brings it back all the time. I think that this is a verse maybe needs to be plastered somewhere uh, throughout your day where you realize, you know, I don't know what else to tell you to do other than cast it again and continue to learn to do it because it will come back. To, the devil wants you afraid, you know. If the, if the national media and the politicians can figure out that fear motivates you and controls people, you got to know the devil knows it, okay? Uh, he can control uh, us when he gets us to dwell on and live in fear, okay? So our step then is to say, what I want to do is I want to cast. And, and I really hope that you can take some time and specifically identify in your life. Um, you know, my wife and I, I think without even asking each other, I know, you know, what the biggest fear is, what she has the hardest time trusting God with. I think she knows what my biggest fear is, what the, I have the hardest time trusting God with. And uh, I, I, if you're struggling with that at all, maybe it would be wise to ask somebody close to you. Uh, definitely ask God, you know, God, God, would you show me what this is? You know, where am I not trusting you? Because God wants us to have this peace. Okay, he wants us that so that we're safe, so that we're guided, so that we have a foot to stand on as far as our witness goes, so that we have something that other people are looking for, and the world is looking for peace, so that we, we have this. So what is the concern that God brought you here today 
to cast. Now, I'm going to suggest something. Uh, worship team, if you would come on back up. Um, I debated a little bit about what song they would sing again, and uh, we're going to go ahead and sing the, the one about the my life began um, in, in the resurrection, just because it is a great song of victory. I'm free. I'm free in that. And we're going to sing about that freedom. But we're, I'm going to invite you. We're, we're all going to stand as we sing that. If and, and this is largely, this might be a big help to you, just to make it uh, s fixed in your mind. We have some you know, wooden steps up here that you could make an altar in your life. You might want to come up and just take a moment and bow here and just say, God, I want to give this to you. I want to cast this on you. That, that, that might help you. You say, oh, I can do it in my seat. Okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fight with anybody here, but but I want to leave that open to you that you know maybe you'd want to come and say, hey, this is something uh, that I am not trusting God with, and I want to give it to Him, and I want to also commit to say when it, when Satan brings it back up, I'm gonna give it to Him again, and uh, this is something God, I want Your peace. I want to claim Your peace. I want to stand in that peace. I want to cast my cares upon You, and I, I think it might be helpful for some of you to come up front. The other thing is as we sing. I'll stand here and sing and, and face with you. If you would like, I really would like to pray with somebody. Um, I will introduce you to somebody, and you can go use my office or Pastor Josh's office or anything like that and have a word of a prayer before you leave. If the idea of the peace of God with, with, that we talked about last week, which is peace as far as that is purchased through the blood of Christ and knowing him, if that's something you'd like to know more about, boy, we'd love to share that with you. So I'm going to stand uh, with you, but I kind of face you, and if you would like to talk to somebody, please come let me know that. Uh, if you would like to use the altar as we sing, just to say, God, this is yours. This is yours. Okay? And by the way, I, I'm, not, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to manipulate you, but I really want to encourage you. So much of the peace is just surrender to Him. Okay? If you're battling Him all the time and, and what He wants to do in your life, we're not going to have peace. So um, I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and sing. Father, um, the work of your spirit is what we are totally dependent upon, his work in our lives. So, Lord, please, uh, we ask for continued ministry of his power, his presence, his conviction, his comfort, and his bringing peace. God, that peace that is your peace that we have because we know you uh, and not just the temporary stuff we can find around here, I pray in your name. Amen. You can stand with us, please.
you think with me for one more time, isn't it amazing that the country that probably has the most of anybody as far as the things this world has to offer has the least peace? Okay, hopefully we learn that's not where we're going to get it. It's going to be found in Christ and in Christ alone. I'll pray that, and I know, sorry, I'm going to ramble here for a second. I know it's a struggle. I know probably some of you are thinking, man, I keep laying it down and it keeps coming back. I don't know what I can say there other than been there, done that. Keep going. Lay it down again. I, I, I don't know what other, uh, I, I don't have like a magical, okay, boom. <laughs> we could do some head slapping. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't have that. I just, just, I want to be the encouragement that says, let's do that again. Let's take First Peter 5, 17? 7, thank you. Uh, and cast our cares upon him over and over again. Okay, you're dismissed. Go in peace. Shalom.